Open to Romans chapter 1. We'll begin our study of Romans today. We'll start in verse 1 and we'll simply go verse by verse. So Romans chapter 1 verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle separated under the gospel of God. We're going to start with simply the word Paul for a minute. And we need to understand something about the word Paul. What, what does the word Paul mean, by the way? Yes, it means small. What was Paul's name before he was saved? Saul. And what does the word Saul mean? Saul means desired. And so look with me, if you would, at 1 Samuel 9, verse 2. 1 Samuel 9, verse 2. Obviously, we'll spend most of our time in Romans, but there are a couple other places that we are going to go. So 1 Samuel 9, verse 2. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. Now, you recall that when Israel asked for a king, they asked for a king that was, you know, the sort of king that they wanted, and they liked King Saul because why? He was a goodly person, and he was tall, and he was all of these things. The name Saul itself means desired, and Saul, King Saul, was desired. I'll also suggest to you that Saul, prior to his conversion, was desired. Look with me at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to begin in verse 4. So Philippians chapter 3 and verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. So here's the comparison I'll suggest to you. When you think of King Saul, King Saul in human terms, looked like what a king should be, right? He was a goodlier person. He was tall. He looked like what a king should look like. What did Saul in the New Testament look like before he met the Lord Jesus Christ? Did he look like sort of the pillar of religious Israel? circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel from the tribe of Benjamin. He's a Pharisee, touching the law, blameless. He looked like exactly what you think, in human terms, a religious leader should look like. But what did Paul himself say about that in Philippians 3? How did he look at all those achievements of the past? Done. At some point, someone will come out with a modern version that truly puts that language in the vernacular of the people, and that'll be special. <laughs> Look with me at Acts 5, verse 34. Acts chapter 5 and verse 34. Acts chapter 5, verse 34. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. So what you see in Acts chapter 5 is that Gamaliel is a very well-regarded teacher of the law. Now compare that with Acts 22 and verse 3. Acts 
chapter 22 and verse 3. I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. So Saul, before his conversion, he's a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He's brought up at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the leading teachers. He, he looks exactly like what a future leader of Israel should look like. And so his name being Saul, I think, is emblematic of was he desired? Was he just like King Saul of the Old Testament? Look with me at Acts 13, verse 9. Acts chapter 13, verse 9. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. In Acts 8, before Paul is converted, he's referred to as Saul. That's his given name, desired. After his conversion in Acts 13, after he's called to the, the work of the ministry, he's called Paul, and Paul means small or little. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 4, verse 11. First Corinthians four and verse eleven. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst, and are naked, and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place, and labor working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it, being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. What I want you to notice is this. When Saul goes from Saul to Paul, he goes from being a big deal in worldly terms to being what in worldly terms? Little, small, the offscouring of the world filth, and so on. Look with me at 1 Timothy 1.16. 1 there are people on TV that will preach the prosperity gospel. God wants you healthy, wealthy, and wise. If you're not doing better financially, it's because there's sin in your life. And if you would tithe more to these organizations, God would open up the windows of heaven and just pour out blessing upon you. Is that true? I mean, what was Paul's experience? Do you remember when we, we in the parables of the kingdom, when we, we looked at some of the parables taught against the Pharisees, what were the Pharisees described as in Luke 16? Covetous. Were the Pharisees worldly successful? They were. So when Paul, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, is brought up at the feet of Gamaliel, what's, he, what's his trajectory in life? He's going to be a big deal. What happens after he meets the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus? He's the opposite of that, isn't he? Look at me in 1 Timothy 1.16. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering now notice this for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting who is our pattern according to the scriptures our pattern is paul now here's what i take from that you can decide if this is right if you are going to preach pauline doctrine 
You cannot reasonably expect the world to stand up and applaud. It's not going to. What's going to happen is those that preach grace will be like Paul, and they will be small. They will be little in worldly terms. They will be small in terms of attendance. They will obviously be small in terms of reputation and prestige. They will be looked down upon. Here's a great example. If you tell someone the grace your church you attend, they will say, how many people go there? Because that is, of course, the best test of truth, right? The best way to figure out whether something is true is how many people believe it. Is that right? That's craziness. That's nonsense. How many people got on the ark? Right? Majority vote is not a determination of truth. But what's going to happen when you preach grace is you will be small in worldly terms. It's just as going to be that way because the world system itself is in opposition to grace truth. So what's fascinating to me, Romans is, of course, the first letter of Paul in his epistles. The very first word of it is Paul. And the very, that one word is rich in meaning because it tells you what happens during the dispensation of grace is that the very act of embracing grace truth is choosing to be small and little in worldly terms. So listen, look, we've already gotten through the first word. <laughs> so let's, let's move right along with all this momentum. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. If, if you look up the term, a servant of God, if you study that term in the scriptures, what you'll find is that Moses is the person in the scriptures most frequently called the servant of God. And I'll just make one note on that before we move on. When you think about Moses and Paul, there is an incredible number of similarities. So, for example, both are uh, described as having participated in a murder. Both are delivered by a basket. And, and when, you, when you go through and you look at all those similarities, both of them go to Mount Sinai to receive revelation. Those similarities are not coincidental. What those similarities do is they are messaging to us that just as Moses is the great revealer of the Old Testament law, so think about what happens with Israel and the Old Testament law. Moses is up on Mount Sinai. He's given the revelation of the law, and then he is to dispense it to Israel. Well, who is his counterpart? His counterpart for the dispensation of grace is Paul, who is given the revelation of the mystery and given it to distribute to humanity. So Romans 1.1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle... And then it says, separated unto the gospel of God. Paul was separated unto the gospel of God. I'll say this briefly. There is more than one gospel in the scriptures. It is widely thought that there is only one gospel and there is only one way everyone was ever saved. And today we are saved looking backward to the cross just as in time past, everyone was saved looking forward to the cross. And there are all of these religious-sounding sayings that seem spiritual, but are simply a denial of clear scriptural truth. If you, if you do something as simple as get a concordance or a Bible search program, and you look up the word gospel, it will tell you again and again that there is more than one gospel in the scriptures. So what Romans 1, 1 says is Paul was separated unto the gospel of God. Now, look with me at verse 2. Which he had promised afore by his prophets in the holy scriptures. Romans 
verse, Romans chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, right out of the bat, it tells us that Paul was separated unto a prophesied gospel. Now, the average dispensationalist loses their mind at that statement because doesn't Paul receive new revelation? He does, according to Ephesians 3. He receives the dispensation of grace, according to Ephesians 3, 2. He receives various mysteries. So how can the Scriptures say that he was separated unto a gospel that was prophesied in the Old Testament? So I'll simply say this uh, for the sake of time. In verse 1, the gospel of God is a prophesied gospel. And when you look at 1 Peter 4, 17, you will see that Peter also preached the gospel of God. When we look at verses 3 and 4, we're going to see the content of the gospel of God. But for now, let me make this observation. Paul taught the gospel of God, and he also taught the gospel of Christ. Now, right now people are having a reaction, and they're saying, well, you're saying Paul preached different gospels. Yes, Scripture says that. Now, what happens all the time, the Word of God violates men's traditions, and men don't like it. Do people have traditions? Do they have things that they think? And then the Word of God says something different, and they're like, huh, I don't like that, because that's not what I believe. That's how men typically react to the Word of God. The Word of God should conform to what they think. And if it doesn't, shame on you. If that's how you approach the Word of God, then what will happen is you will remain trapped in whatever you happen to believe at this moment. Because what needs to happen is the Word of God needs to change your thinking so that it matches the Word of God. So in Romans 1.1, there's a gospel of God. In Romans 1.16, there's a gospel of Christ. Paul preached both of those. Now, one way people deal with that is they will say, well, gospel of God, gospel of Christ, Christ is God, so they're the same thing. Ta-da! The problem is, if you actually sit and read what these gospels are, they're not the same thing. So Romans 1, verses 1 and 2 he separated under the gospel of God, which was promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. That's clearly a gospel that was prophesied. But when you read 1 Corinthians 9, and it talks about the gospel of Christ, it specifically says it was a dispensation of the gospel that was committed unto Paul. That was something that was new. What does the word gospel mean? Good news. Well, whenever someone says there's only one gospel in the Bible... So what you're saying is God is only allowed to have one item of good news, and that's it. So God, pick one. You get one piece of good news, and you can't have any more. God is not subject to your artificial constraints. There is more than one item of good news in the Scriptures. All right, so Romans 1, 2, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. You can see from 1 Peter 4, 17 that Peter preached the gospel of God. Paul himself preached the gospel of God. So they had that in common. But what Paul then did is in addition to preaching the gospel of God, he also preached the gospel of Christ. And what Peter did is in addition to preaching the gospel of God, he preached the gospel of the kingdom Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Look with me at Romans 1, verse 3. What we will see in verses 3 and 4 is we will see the content of the gospel of God. And when we see this content, hopefully you will realize that this content was preached by both Peter and Paul. So verse 3, Concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, 
which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. In other words, the content of the gospel of God is two pieces of information. The first is that Jesus Christ was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. In other words, he was a descendant of David. The second item is that he was declared to be the Son of God by what event? By the resurrection. So now let's take those two items. Jesus Christ was of the seed of David, and he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection. Did Peter preach that, or did Paul preach that? Well, they both did, didn't they? Look with me at Acts chapter 2, verse 29. Acts chapter 2, <coughs> verse 29. Now, this is Peter. This is the day of Pentecost. He's speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Isn't that exactly what Romans 1 was talking about? That Jesus Christ would be made of the seed of David? Verse 31, He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. In Acts 2, <clears throat> Peter is preaching the gospel of God, that Jesus Christ was made of the seed of David and that he was the Christ, he was the Son of God, and declared to be so by the resurrection from the dead. In Romans 1, verses 1 to 4, Paul himself preached that exact same thing. Look with me at 2 Timothy 2, Verse 8. As you study the New Testament, you will see that there are different things that Peter and Paul taught. They didn't teach the exact same thing. But were there a bunch of things that they had in common? It wasn't the case that everything they taught was different. Did they both preach that Jesus was the Christ? Did they both preach He was the Son of God? Did they both preach the resurrection? They, they, there's a ton of things that they had in common. A false balance is an abomination unto the Lord. If you're going to teach the Scriptures properly, you should teach that there were differences between Peter and Paul, but you should not teach only that there were differences between Peter and Paul, because there were many things that were the same. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ, of the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Well, that couldn't be more clear, could it? Jesus Christ was of the seed of David. He was raised from the dead. And that's according to whose gospel? my gospel. So Paul's gospel included the gospel of God, the fact that Jesus Christ was of the seed of David and raised from the dead. Go back with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and we'll look at verse 5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. <clears throat> when Paul says by whom in verse 5, he's saying that he received his apostleship directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, that's what occurred on the road to Damascus. We know that he was sent to the Gentiles and that he is the apostle of the Gentiles, according to Romans eleven thirteen. Verse 6, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. 
verse 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to touch on the phrase, called to be saints. Some have the idea that what God does is he picks certain people to be saved and says, yes, yes, no, 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 yes, no, no, no. And that he individually decides who's saved and who's not. That is a wicked doctrine because, number one, it denies man's free will. And number two, it makes God arbitrary because he decides, well, I'm saving you, but I'm not saving you. How dare you? How, how dare you say that about God? So what does it mean here when it says, called to be saints? Look with me at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. When it says called to be saints, it's not saying God picked to save one of you and not another. That's not it at all. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our what? Gospel. How did God call people to be saved? Did he say, I want you and not you? I want you and not you? Or did he call all of humanity? He called all of humanity because how did he call them? He didn't whisper in your ear, I hope you get saved. He called all of humanity by the preaching of the gospel. And of course, the sad reality is that much of humanity ignored the call, right? Much of humanity heard the call and said, not interested. But that's not the fault of God because God called all men to be saints. And how did he call them? He called them by the gospel. Go back with me to Romans chapter 1, verse 7. <clears throat> Now, obviously, in verse 7, Paul's writing to those that are in Rome. And I, I want to make one observation here. The book of Romans appears to be the only letter that Paul writes to a group that he has not visited. So what am I saying? If you think of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians as a for instance, or 1 Corinthians, what happens with those is Paul was in that location. So he was in Thessalonica. He preached there, and he subsequently wrote to them to give them some information or correct something in their thinking. In other words, it was a church that he had established he then later on was writing to that church to provide them instruction. Romans is the only church where that is not the case. He's writing to the saints at Rome before he has ever been there. Now get with me Acts chapter 18, verse 2. One of the things that's one of the things that people sometimes wonder about is they will ask about churches, different churches in the scriptures. Well, was that church Gentiles or Jews? And there's lots of crazy ideas people have today about the little flock and just there's all kinds of confusion. So what I just want you to notice for the moment is the saints at Rome are exclusively or at least predominantly, Gentiles. Now, how do I know that? Look at Acts 18, verse 2. Acts chapter 18, verse 2. And found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Why? Because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. So prior to Acts 18.2, what had Claudius done? He had commanded 
that all Jews need to leave Rome. When you study the writing of the book of Romans, it's rather clear that Romans is written in Acts chapter 20. In fact, it's written in Acts chapter 20, verse 3. That's the time of its writing. So when Paul is writing to the church at Rome, and he's talking about the saints that are there, who do those saints have to be given Acts 18 to? Well, they have to be Gentiles because prior to that, Claudius had demanded that all Jews had to depart from Rome. So go back with me to Romans chapter 1, and we'll look at verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. I'll make one observation on that. We talked earlier a little bit about Paul meaning small and being the filth of the world, the off-scouring and so on. And grace churches are going to be like that. One of the things that happens is that although the grace churches are small and the off-scouring of the world, it can simultaneously be true that their faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. That's what Romans 1.8 says. As a comparison, get 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 8. 1 Thessalonians, and we'll look at chapter 1 and verse 8. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia, Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad. So the Thessalonians were similar to the Romans in that capacity. Go back with me to Romans chapter 1, verse 9. Romans chapter 1, verse 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. I want to say something here about prayer. You have probably heard it taught at one point or another that people that are truly spiritual pray eight hours a day. And they're prayer warriors and they accomplish great things because they pray so long. And I will just simply tell you I believe that is unscriptural and incorrect. When people look at the phrase, for example, pray without ceasing, which Paul uses in 1 Thessalonians 5, and he uses that elsewhere, what people hear when they hear pray, pray without ceasing is they say, well, you got to pray and pray and pray longer, and the longer you pray, the more spiritual it is. Read the verse we just read. that without ceasing, I make mention. Well, isn't the very phrase make mention brief? If you make mention of something, does that mean you go on a diatribe and you talk four hours about it? Or does it, the whole essence of make mention is it's brief, it's concise, it's to the point. When Paul says without ceasing, I make mention, he's not saying I sat down and I prayed for the Romans yesterday for six hours. And because I prayed for six hours, God's going to accomplish something. What he's saying is this. Without ceasing, I make mention means I prayed briefly for them yesterday. And I prayed briefly for them today. And I prayed briefly for them the next day. And he is without ceasing because he didn't quit making mention but it's not saying, well, spiritual prayer. I only prayed for, you know, I'll have a confession. Yesterday I prayed for Jim for only two hours, and I felt really guilty about it. I'm kidding. Is it somehow more spiritual if I pray for you longer? Have you ever seen people pray where, oh, God, 
we beg you to do this and that, and, 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 and it, it's just a bunch of wordage. Whereas when it is authentic and not for a show, you just get to the point. Do you see what I'm getting at? I want you to think about something with me. What men typically do is our natural instinct is self-righteousness, self-justification, a performance system. That if I do this and this and this, then I'll please God. Is that the way that your life in Christ works? Is God waiting for you to do A and B and C, and once you do all of those things, then he'll be pleased with you? Is it that, or have you already been made accepted in the beloved? You're already accepted. What people often do, and they're taught this, is their prayer life becomes a performance where you have to do a whole bunch of things. You have to pray so long for God to hear you. And I just want you to notice, Paul says the exact opposite. When he says, without ceasing, I make mention, he's, he's just telling you that it's brief, right? That's the whole point of the verse. So what's fascinating is that men get it the exact wrong way. Look with me at, at Matthew 23, 14. I guess I'm going to spend a few minutes on this because I want to land this point. Matthew 23, 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, now notice this, and for a pretense make long prayer. Is the long prayer in that verse spiritual, or is it actually an offense to God? It's a pretense. If I tell you I'm going to prove the sincerity of my prayer by praying longer. It's fake. Do I have to pray for you seven times before, because God forgot the first six? God, please help Jim. Please help Jim. No, God, I really want you to help Jim. You're not listening. He's not hard of hearing and he's not forgetful. That's why all you have to do is make mention. And by the way, he knew before you even uttered it, right? Prayer has become a performance system in the way that it is commonly understood that is unscriptural, not really prayer, and in fact an offense. Look with me at Matthew 6, verse 7. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. What you need to do, you need to go home and pray the Our Father 12 times. And if you pray the Our Father 12 times, not 11, but 12 then God will grant you blessing. Do you realize that's vain repetition? You're just repeating things. There's no sincerity in it. If you have the belief that if I vainly repeat this so many times and I hit that magic number, then I've hit the quota, and now God says, you did it. Now you get the blessings. 11 wasn't good enough, but 12 is. You realize that's all fake? It's vain, according to the Scriptures. Who prays that way according to the Scriptures? What does it say? The heathen. Doesn't say the spiritual. Doesn't say the wise. Doesn't say the spiritually instructed. It says the heathen think about prayer that way. Get Daniel 6, verse 10.
Daniel 6, verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees. So he actually kneeled in prayer, which is a scriptural practice. And it says he kneeled upon his knees, then what does it say? Three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. I would suggest to you the, spiritual, the, the, the scriptural practice of prayer is not, I have to be in prayer six hours a day and I have to vainly repeat things. And if I, do, if I speak long enough, God hears me. That is just a heathen view of prayer. The scriptural view of prayer is what you do is you pray without ceasing and that you pray for people and you pray for them the next day and you pray for them and you continue to pray for them. And you do so making mention and the frequency is three times a day, Daniel 6.10. I think that's the scriptural pattern. I think a lot of the stuff that we've been taught is just, it's just a bunch of religious superstition. Go back with me to Romans chapter 1 verse 10. Romans 1, verse 10. Making request. I'll just say something about making request. Have you seen the people on TV where they command God what to do? And God, you need to do this and bind the strong man and they give God a whole bunch of orders as to what he's supposed to do. What does the scripture say? Making request. In other words, we're not... The, the prayer attitude of bossing God around is, is just really quite ridiculous. Making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. So Paul's praying for something there. He's praying that he would have a prosperous journey, and he's making request. Look with me at Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. One of the questions people sometimes ask is, can I ask God for physical things or other things in my life? And the answer is, yes, you can. Paul himself made requests. Philippians 4, verse 6, be careful for nothing. Don't let yourself be overwhelmed with the anxieties of the, of the world. Be careful for nothing but in everything, in every situation, in every circumstance, in every trial. By prayer and supplication, notice the next part, with thanksgiving. The, re the reason why it says with thanksgiving there is this. A lot of times our prayer lives can be a list of things we want from God and complaints about things that He's supposed to make things better. God fix this and fix that and so on. At times, our prayer life can be unthankful. Here's why I emphasize this. If you take all the problems in your life or you imagine all the problems that could happen, you know, you could lose your job, you could be imprisoned, you could be paralyzed, you go through whatever horrible list you can think of. None of that would change the fact that you are complete in Him. None of that would change the fact that you have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. None of that would change your accepted in the Beloved. All those things are true for you, irrespective of your physical state. What happens is we focus so much on our immediate physical circumstances, and they overwhelm us, and they depress us, and they cause us all these problems. And what we need to do is we need to have the perspective, say, well, wait a minute. Yes, these immediate circumstances are problematic, but none of these affect who I am in Christ. So they're just very small. Now, are they real? Yeah, they're real, but they're real for a very short window of time, which is why our requests need to be made with thanksgiving. Let's keep reading here. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Verse 6 started with, be careful for nothing. So here's the way prayer works. 
at least as I understand it. Do you ever encounter situations in life where you're overwhelmed, where the situation is a problem and you don't know how to deal with it? How am I, how am I going to address this? This is really a problem. What prayer allows you to do is to let your request be made known unto God. You pray about it. And the reason why you can have peace in verse 7 is, God, I have this problem. It's too big for me. I don't know what to do with it. Here's my request. I request that you fix this, because I can't. Now, when I do that, here's what I've done. I've taken a problem that's too big for me and put it in God's hands, because it's not too big for him. So one of two things is going to happen. He's either going to fix the problem, in which case, great, or he's not going to fix the problem, in which case, great. Because even if he doesn't fix the problem, I can have the peace of, I've committed this into God the Father's hands, and he's either going to fix it or he won't, but either way, his love for me remains. And even if he doesn't change the circumstance, is his grace sufficient for me to endure it? So what prayer does, it allows me to unburden myself. It allows me to say, God, this problem which I can't handle is now yours. And whatever you want to do with it, I'm okay because I know you love me, and however you choose to handle it will be fine. And that's what prayer fundamentally does. Is, is, is it a guarantee that all the physical problems of your life are going to be solved? No. Because you know what's going to happen? You're going to die at some point. Unless you live to see the rapture, you're going to die. So has God promised to fix every circumstantial physical problem in your life today? He hasn't. But you are complete in Him. And you have the grace to endure anything that you happen to face. Go back with me to Romans 1, verse 11. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established. So that verse specifically says Paul wanted to impart a spiritual gift unto the Romans. And he says that he longed to see them to do that. Look with me at 1 Timothy 4, verse 14. First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy. Now notice what it says with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. 1 Timothy 4.14 says that Timothy received a gift, and how did he receive that gift? What mechanism? Laying on of hands. Isn't that what it says? Look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse... 6, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by what? The putting out of my hands. So what happened during the early days of the dispensation of grace what mechanism, how did God impart gifts unto people? The laying on of hands. Isn't that what those two verses say? Now, sometimes people don't like that, but what happens when you bump into a couple verses that say something? You need to just believe what it says. God used the mechanism of the laying on of hands to impart spiritual gifts during the early part of the dispensation of grace. Now, if I lay hands on you today, you know what that will accomplish? Nothing. But at that time, it did. 
Go back with me to Romans 1, verse 11. Now notice what Paul says here. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. Why didn't he just send it in the mail? Why didn't he just send it with Romans? He couldn't send it with the epistle for what reason? He longed to see them so that he could lay hands on them and impart unto them a spiritual gift. That's what he's saying there. Now, I, I told you earlier that it was a significant fact that Romans is the only epistle that is written to a church that Paul hadn't previously visited. One of the reasons that matters, Paul doesn't say that in Romans 1.11 to any of the other churches, because all those other churches, you know what happened? He was there physically present when the church was created, and he could ordain elders at that time, and he could lay hands and, and do whatever needed to be done. Romans, he had never visited. That's why he says in verse 11, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. Now notice what this says here. To the end ye may be established. Get Ephesians 4, verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. One of the issues the early body of Christ had to deal with is they had to figure out how to operate without the Word of God being complete. So as you and I think about things today, if we want to know what we should do, we have all of the Scriptures. We can read them. We have all of Paul's epistles. We have Romans to 2 Timothy. We have everything that he wrote that God included in the Scriptures. But how did the church, early church function before 2 Timothy was written? Because it's not written until the end of Paul's life. So what do you do? Do you say, well, we'll just wait 30 years. Paul will be martyred, and then we'll know what we should do. Because God will have written all the letters he wanted. Well, what he did, look with me at Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he gave. Past tense. Not, and he is giving, and he gave. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. God gave those gifts past tense. For what purpose? For the edifying of the body of Christ. Because the Word of God was not yet complete. Verse 13 till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What God did with the apostles and prophets and the pastors and teachers is He gave them as spiritual gifts so that the early body of Christ knew how to function before the written Word of God was complete. But guess what happened when the written Word of God was complete? Guess what was no longer needed? The apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers that were given as special gifts. So what happens today is this. Do we have apostles today? We don't. Do we have prophets today? We don't. Do we have gift pastors and teachers today? No, we don't. Now, does the office of a bishop still exists? Sure, there's people that need to fulfill that role. But they're not a spiritual gift from God the way that Ephesians 4 was. Now what that means then is this, and this is significant. Since you don't have apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers like Ephesians 4 describes, that means you're going to have to go by the Word of God. See, now think about this just for a minute, and this is what I think people would want. If your pastor and teacher is a gift from God, oh, this is good because I don't have to think. So what will happen is whatever the pastor says, let's go with that. But what actually happens today, now that the Word of God has been fully given, we now each have a responsibility to know what God wrote because that's how we're to know the will of God. This is my opinion. Decide for yourself. 
People say all the time, well, God spoke to me in a still small voice and God told me this and God told me that and he gave me a vision and I'm supposed to go do this. Now here's what I find interesting. All these folks with all these visions and all these folks that God has spoken to, he never told any of them, what you need to do, my call for your life is I want you to be a King James mid-Acts dispensationalist that preaches the gospel of grace. None of them say that. But the Word of God says that. So guess which one is right? See, what happens is all these things that people perceive to have happened, it's just their imagination or some sort of confusion. If the Holy Spirit was actually speaking to people today the way they think, he would tell them to be King James and Mid-Acts Dispensationalists. And he'd tell them to quit preaching a confused gospel. But all these people that think they claim to hear from the Holy Spirit, he never tells them anything important. He tells them nonsense. He tells them things like, go build a new building. Wouldn't he tell them to preach the Word of God clearly before he told them to build something? Hopefully you see my point. <clears throat> what, what I'm getting at is that we don't take seriously enough the fact that God has preserved His Word, and the reason He preserved His Word for us is that He expects it to read it. He didn't just preserve it for kicks. Look, I'm going to preserve my Word and Satan can't destroy it. Look how strong I am. He preserved it. Because it's the basis on which he's going to judge humanity. And humanity's indifference to what it says, including the body of Christ's indifference to what it says, is folly. Do you get that, hopefully? The fact of God's preservation of his word emphasizes our responsibility to study it and to know what it says because God is not imparting spiritual gifts today the way that he did in the past. Okay, so Romans 1.11, what's going on there is Paul's writing to the saints at Rome that he hasn't visited yet, and they haven't been established yet, because the spiritual gifts will help establish them, and he hasn't been there to impart those gifts by the laying on of hands. So Romans is a very useful book, and I think this is why it's the first one in the canon. The, the, Paul's epistles are not included in the canon in the order in which he wrote them, because Romans wasn't the first epistle that he wrote. But they are included in the canon according to God's design for our instruction. So Romans is an appropriate book to come first because it's written to a church that had not yet been established. You see that? Hopefully you do. All right, so we're in Romans 1. Let's go to Romans 1, verse 12. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. What's intriguing about that, Paul the Apostle finds comfort in the faith of others. And that, in and of itself, should tell you the importance of being in a local assembly. If Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, found comfort in others' faith, then it's appropriate for us to do that also. Okay, we've made it through verse 12. I was hopeful to get through half the chapter, but I have not accomplished that. So we will pick up next time in verse 13. Let me close this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. We thank you for the saints. We thank you for your preserved word. We pray, Lord, that we would be busy studying it and that we would come to a, a greater understanding of your will. We pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you would stand.